Hey, Bikeaholic, Zero 3D has a wide variety of innovative products for your Harley-Davidson and a brand new line for the all-new Honda Goldwing named Gold Strike Top Quality Affordable Chrome Lighting and Comfort Products. Zero Gold Strike R, the motorcycle LED lighting innovators for CAN, bus, plug-and-play system compatibility. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store. Check out our full line of Zero 3D products. All right, email here. Steve Price of Cleveland, Ohio. He writes... Ryan, first, let me tell you how your videos have saved me a ton of dealership costs. I own a 2013 Ultra Classic with 12,500 miles. I had a personal injury, 2014-15 time frame, and was unable to ride nearly a year. I had a bad fall and ended up with a severe head concussion, leaving me with months of therapy. I finally got back on the bike this year, and uh, only to find my charging system took a dive in the dumpster. I am very mechanically inclined, but being my first Harley, I was very skeptical uh, skeptical to attempt replacement of the uh, stator and voltage regulator. Your videos and explanations made it clear to the point of not really needing a service manual. Yes, I have an online manual, way cool. I also performed my first three-hole oil change, during an inspection, I noticed my rear brakes were in desperate need of replacement. You gave me the confidence to also perform brake replacement. The last thing was a complete brake line flush. Now the cost minus dealer doing the work, charging system, $500 from Harley upgrade to 54 amps. Rear pads uh, from my Harley dealer, $57. Complete three-hole oil change, include oil filter, $89. And air filter from dealer stock, $26. Dealer cost, so now he's doing the dealer cost. That was his cost. So now he's moving to the dealer cost. His charging system in trouble, shooting $600. Rear pads, $125 an hour. Oil change, $380. Of course, dealer costs are estimated. Bottom line, saving close to $800 to $1,000. Took me about five to six hours of work uh, uh, for all that work. Dealer once scheduled, they were really uh, already scheduled out a week plus. So again, thank you for all your time putting all this together. If you are ever in Northern Ohio, Cleveland area, we'll be more than happy to take you around. Very cool. That's the feedback. That's why we do what we do here, guys. Love absolutely helping the biker community. Over 600 videos on the YouTube channel now. Some, you know, tutorial, DIY, some obviously entertainment uh, value, the documentaries and all that kind of stuff, but tons of tutorial videos on there. And uh, so thank you, Steve, for writing in. Really appreciate the feedback. That's why we do what we do. Lawabidingbiker.com forward slash contact is how he got a hold of us. Uh, anytime you guys can leave an email right there on our contact form, or you can leave a voicemail. We love the voicemails too. We love the voice feedback. We love hearing your lovely voices. Uh, you can leave a voicemail over there right on your uh, built-in microphone uh, from your computer from anywhere in the world. Makes it super simple, guys. We definitely love uh, getting feedback. So please, guys, hit us up on our contact form. Even if it's just a thanks or an experience or a question, hit, hit us up, contact, and uh, also the voicemails. Want to ride longer? Tired of a sore and achy ass? Then fix it with a high-quality butt buffer seat cushion. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com for a store and check out our lineup of butt buffer seat cushions. Oh, yeah. Once you've had Rick Rack, you'll never go back. The ultimate motorcycle luggage rack solution. Forget those messy straps and bungee cords. Go strapless with a Rick Rack quick attached luggage system and quality bag. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com for a store. Get hooked up now. Oh, yeah. Got a special episode for you guys. I'm going to leave you hanging maybe two episodes. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's going to be part one of two. You'll find out in a minute. Got a special guest on here. Got a special guest. Welcome back, you freaking bikeholics. This is the podcast for the motorcycle majority of the big MM, also known as the 99%. That's right, large and in charge of the motorcycle scene more than any time in history by being here, by listening. You are part of what we call the hashtag biker revolution. Mm -hmm. Still growing, rapidly growing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's support. We appreciate so much. We do have just one question before we get started. What are you waiting for, bikeholics? Mount up. Let me and my special guest take you 
on another wild ass ride. There you go, guys. Ryan Erlacher here, your host of the Law Abiding Biker Podcast, and of course, your high tech red neck. All right, a couple things before we get started. This is going to be one of those, one of my favorite episodes to record um, because it's uh, one of our biker talk episodes. And uh, I do have a patron member, probably by the title. You already know who it is, but you probably may or may not have met him yet. But uh, it got some cool stories. And uh, like I say, I think because he also did something really cool for the Law Abiding Biker Shop. And uh, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk. He's got a lot of history and a lot of background, um, and uh, we're going to talk a lot of motorcycle stuff, and then we're probably going to stray off a bit, too, on some other cool stuff uh, that we'll talk about, but it's all technically biker-related, and uh, I love getting the backgrounds of people. So I'm thinking this is probably going to be part one of two uh, for this uh, special biker talk episode. So uh, grab yourself a beverage of your choice and dive in because that's all we're going to do is talk. We got some mics here and we're just going to see where the conversation takes us. Now, just want to mention a new free video, of course, been out for a while, um, but check it out over on the YouTube channel. I try to announce these uh, so you guys are aware. And that's our Rick Rack GoPro fork mount for Hardy Davidson 2014 to present. It is an awesome uh, universal uh uh, I guess shit, this isn't the universal one. This is the fork mount, very specific to mounting up on the forks. It actually gets some really cool shots. And uh, I believe in that video, I put in some of those shots if you want to see what they look like. But very unique perspective for, from Rick Rack. And we also have our Rick Rack universal mount, which I use a lot too. I've already done a video in the past on that. That's the one that clamps around round bar. You can put on your crash bars, your luggage rack, whatever kind of angles you want. Just uh, all in the Law Abiding Biker store, of course. And I will put a link to it in the show notes to this video, lawabidingbiker.com forward slash whatever episode number it is. And uh, you can uh, get that. But again, it's all over in our store and the videos are embedded right on the product pages. Now we love our sponsors, of course, up front, um, but these folks are also sponsors of the show and uh, big sponsors and making it happen. We've got one right here in the studio today. Our beloved patron members, I want to thank the new patron members, Brad Shea of Olympia, Washington, right over the mountains from us. Thank you. Justin Darrow of Sulphur Springs, Texas. Gerald Solter, Swelter, I guess, of Peroria, Peroia, Illinois, top tier. James R. McKinley of Banning, California. David Mallow of East Helena, Montana. Kenneth Herman of Buckeye, Arizona. Finishing it off, BJ Harvey of Elta, Mississippi. Bob Jones of Kansas City, Missouri. Tom Bolin of Northboro, Massachusetts. Lawabidingbiker.com forward slash Patreon is how they did that. Pledge a certain amount per piece of content. No risk to you because you can put a monthly cap. Of course, there are benefits such as t-shirts and stickers. You get into the uh, private Facebook group, which is a troll-free zone. You get live video broadcasts and chat. Access to our podcast months before everybody else like this one will go in your patron accounts and uh, up to access to our premium videos up on request and just continuing to ramp up the patron membership and uh, grow this thing we call the biker revolution in 2021 all right here we are we're gonna dive in who do i got on the mic here today i'm gonna I'll give you just a little bit of background here, just uh, briefly, so you kind of know where we're going with the conversation. So, this is Terry McDonough of Medford, Oregon. First time on the mic. He's at today. Um, so, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Terry obviously signed up as a patron member. The first time I met Terry, uh, and we'll go into deeper um, into some of this, but I'll give you guys how we got hooked up. Uh, the first time I actually met Terry in person was at the West Coast patron member meetup um, in Redmond, Oregon, that uh, patron member Brad Johnston organized and hosted. There's a documentary film out on there. Terry's in that film. Uh, so if you want to go see Terry, he's over there. But he had he had talked to me then, and uh, so we kind of got to know each other. We rode. Well, then, right after that, we did the Sturgis. So the Sturgis 2020 80th anniversary, we did the sanctioned, the actual law-abiding biker uh, hosted patron meetup and ride event. And so I had already met Terry months before. And so I got to talk to Terry again. 
And one of the conversations uh, that spurred, uh, Terry just asked me a question. And he asked me, he said, hey, I noticed that uh, you just have wood workbenches in, your sh- in the law-abiding biker shop because he's seen the videos and stuff. And uh, you are correct, Terry, I do. And he asked, uh, do you, have you ever thought about why didn't you do metal workbenches? And here's what I say. Um, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so when I built the shop and I had never even thought about metal top workbenches, I didn't know anybody personally that works with sheet metal or anything like that. So it's just like, I grew up with wood workbenches and my dad had some metal ones, but they were all like for welding. They were very specific tables and stuff like that. Super thick steel and stuff. So anyways, he, I found out that he is a sheet metal worker and uh, very crafty and has been doing a long, long time. And so he offered, this is the amazing biker community and especially the patron member community and how close everybody is and just nothing but bikers helping bikers. He offered, said he wanted to put metal tops to the workbenches here in the law abiding biker shop. So over the past months, I was like, this is really cool. I've got to make a documentary film about this because I'm really interested in um, everybody's got a different craft and, and sheet metal work to me, although I don't know a lot about it. I wanted to learn a bit about it. And I think it's really artistic whether somebody, a sheet metal worker thinks it's art or not, that's, uh, you know, up to them. But to me, it's a different form of art to be able to work with the metals and create, you're creating to me, and he's made some different parts, which we'll get into. It's, it's a creation to me. So to me, it's, it's a form of art. You're crafting something out of a thought or an idea or sheet metal. But anyways, so I, he came up Medford, Oregon, let me tell you, is a seven hour drive if it's not snowing and there's a lot of passes and it's winter now. So uh, Terry just experienced that. I also experienced because Terry came up, took the measurements and all that. And we're going to get deeper into this, but it just gives you guys an idea. And then um, went back down, got the materials we needed. Then I went down to, if you guys follow on Instagram or Facebook, the private Facebook group and all that, I've been posting a lot of this process. I went down to film more. I did an interview up here on camera, got those shots, went down there, got the actual him and his metal workshop, you know, making them, bending them, grinding, welding, doing all that stuff. And then I came back home and then here we are. He got them done or brought them up to actually do the installation, which is why he's here today in the studio. And I figured he's coming up anyways. So we had planned um, that that uh, we would do a, a, a podcast and he has got just, just from us talking, he's got a lot of really cool stories and information and his background is interesting to me. And this is what the biker community is all about. So it's just BSing with each other, uh, learning about each other. So that's kind of the background and how Terry ended up here today, sitting across from me on a podcast guys. And you never know, you know, when you meet people, I've met so many cool in the patron group and some of the patrons have been here uh, in the studio and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, neat. So we hope to just continue that into the future. We love connecting um, with the members, especially, you know, our supporting, supporting beloved patron members. So Terry, welcome. Thank you. Are you tired of hearing me talk? No, it's okay. All I right. hear you all the time on the <laughs> videos anyway. Yeah, that's true. Does it sound sound the same here? Oh yeah. Pretty much. Yep. yep. My voice doesn't sound different. So it's the first time Terry's been on a mic and uh, he's got, he's got his cans on his headphones and uh, I forget, uh, you know, just how um, it can be different for people. He's never had, I'm so used to it. And the first thing he said is it doesn't sound like my voice because yeah. it's coming right <laughs> in your ears. You usually don't hear it amplified and all crisp and clear on a yeah. microphone. So um, anyways, thanks for being here. You bet. Appreciate it. We're going to have a good time. Yep. Uh, we're just going to kick back. So Terry, tell me a little bit. Let's uh, let's take it back a little bit. Well, if we're gonna do that, back. we need to do that. I'm gonna take it back to little Terry. Oh, little Terry, <laughs> little Hellion Terry. Uh-oh. <laughs> Trust me, I don't know. I didn't do a background check, yeah. but you know there may be something. I don't know. Um, but just jaded, uh, just <laughs> jaded. So tell me a little bit about um, to get to know you a little bit before we dive into motorcycles and kind of stuff like that. Are you originally from? Medford Oregon. area, yeah. Uh, Jacksonville. Yeah. It's outside of Medford. Mm-hmm. It's a, is it a suburb or is it a little bit of ways? It's a hick town. 
<laughs> no, it's about five miles out of Medford. It's old mining town. It isn't now. It's all yep de yep, you know. But back okay, in, back in the day, it was just an old town. Where were they mining back then? Like in the mountains there, or right under town? There's tunnels under town even today. Really? Yeah, but the whole area was uh, a mining area. The property that we had was mined back in the 20s, 30s, right in there. But it was set up as a mine, as a, uh, well, what do you want to say? A diversion, because it, the, the main thing for that property, they had a big still there because of prohibition. And so the mine operated to cover the still operation. Oh, interesting. <laughs> There's <laughs> bottles all over the place, man. <laughs> wow. Jugs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So they tunneled it all over there. Is that? In town they did, yeah. They had okay. a bunch of Chinese labor, and that's what did most of the mining. But there, occasionally there'll be a street will collapse because of the tunnels under the town. Little things you don't yeah. know, see? Yeah, a lot of the buildings have uh, underground uh bunkers i guess you'd call it that's what they look like but uh, doors that lead into the tunnels which nobody does that anymore because it's pretty dangerous yeah yeah the, yeah you don't want to be running through those tunnels there any um can you visit like did the city no uh, they uh, didn't like no. keep any for like museum type where you could go visit at least part of the tunnel or anything no uh -uh. just closed or down huh yep did they just bury them so you can't get in them well some of them are still open it, there's under the buildings yeah, under the building just yeah still there but mm -hmm. yeah if they don't cave in don't bother you know it ain't broke so don't fix it <laughs> right wow so when did they close all those up do you think oh probably about the time the mining ended 30s something like that okay of course i wasn't around then so right 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 yeah oh really you're not that old <laughs> no, oh no, interesting not, not okay <laughs> my mom told me about it <laughs> okay wow that's an interesting little factoid that a lot of people just wouldn't know so you grew up jacksonville around there um what did you guys what was your uh what did you guys do in jacksonville i mean what's the trade there for your parents and stuff growing up well my mom was stay at home okay dad was a plasterer and that's what he did plasterer yeah did a lot of swimming pools and you, you name it he did it did you do any of that helping him or anything he'd never teach us said you don't need to know this <laughs> really it's a dying trade basically oh is that why mm -hmm. Yeah, he'd never tell us or never show us. We watched him, but he didn't go any farther than that. No shit. Yeah. So he was he was trying to protect you. Yeah, he thought he was. <laughs> 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 then we both, me and my brother, both wound up in the sheet metal business. So, you know. Yeah. Did you learn sheet metal? Did you learn that anything from sheet metal from him? No. no. So he didn't do that on the side or no, anything no, like I, that? No. Okay. So what'd you grow up? What'd you grow up doing? Wrecking a lot of stuff. Yeah? You know, cars, you know, when you start doing that, and lawnmowers, you know, where you start. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we didn't have a lot of places to go because we lived out from town. It was a three-mile walk into Jacksonville. But, uh, yeah, there was no no place for kids to go. Yeah, did you have a big chunk of property? or? Yeah, we had like 40 acres, and the kids next door to us, they're Parents had like 1,100 acres, and we run around together a lot. Okay. Killing things, you know. Right, yeah. We did a lot of that. 22 stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we had around here was orchards, yeah. and, uh, and it was all apple for the most part where I live. There's a ton of other farms here too, but- uh, no, that's how we grew up too, just riding all bicycles all over the countryside, raising hell, to, yeah, shooting stuff, just hunting in the orchards and mm -hmm. shooting magpies and- and uh, well, shooting whatever moved back whatever then, moved. <laughs> pretty much, you know, started with BB guns and then moved into 22s. And um, yeah, it was, sounds like we grew up yeah. very similar, it was just all country and ponds, went fishing in the ponds and rafting on the ponds and just, yeah, not a ton <laughs> of supervision. No. You could be gone all day and your parents had no clue where you were. Right. You know, they just knew you'd come back about dinner time yeah. on your bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> dirty, beat up, yep. maybe a cuts. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That's, people don't, do, do kids grow up like that anymore? I don't Anywhere so. in America? We used to set a lot of fires in the wintertime. We did the same thing. The, the wood rats nest. We'd search those out and get the dogs after the rats when they run up trees, shoot them, and the dogs attack them when they hit the ground. But yeah. you just open up the wood rat nest, 
Light it on fire. Nice. It's all dry. Yeah. <laughs> exterminators. <laughs> right, exterminators, yeah. Yeah, in the making. Yep. In the making. Oh, that's interesting. I should have done that. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> you should have. Yeah, we used to do that too. Snow out in the in the winter, and we'd build campfires down by the ponds, and then the pond would freeze over. Oh, this the pond would freeze over. And when it get, got cold enough around here, um, so that would freeze. And again, zero supervision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause I'm not sure that a lot of the shit I know that a lot of, I'm lucky to be alive yep. and not fully paralyzed. Um, but the pond would freeze over and we'd go out on the pond mm -hmm. and we would make a, uh, so we took our, um, our bicycle tires cause we all had this BMX bikes. Right. And, uh, I remember, and my dad had all kinds of uh, stuff like supplies, like he was a hardware store but he didn't throw stuff away, you know? So it, you literally, he had lumber and, and he's, you know, and, and screws and parts. And so anyways, we could pretty much find whatever we wanted in dad's shop. And we wanted to have uh, bike races on the frozen pond. And this sounds like a good idea, doesn't oh, it? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you, we had to go take and make studs. So we would take our tires and we drill holes in them. And then we put a bolt through just a threaded bolt washer on both side and a nut to keep it on and we would spike the shit out of those tires and then we would go have races and you could get leaning pretty good you know what i mean and you we would have a circle track and so you <laughs> you would lean but when you went if you if you had just got just a little too much lean so it was a fine line of how fast you and we would but man when you slammed you slammed and then you yep. would just slide <laughs> all the way across to the side of the punt yep. you hit the bank you know but just stupid shit. Luckily, none of us ever yeah. cracked because it, it, none of us fell through. There was times when it got a little warm and uh, you'd hear it crack a little bit when mm -hmm. you got on it. But that, you think that stopped us? No. We had a pond too and had ice on it. Freaking idiots. The worst thing, or not the worst, the weirdest thing, the cows would go out and walk on the ice, licking the ice. Really? Just very strange. <laughs> Did any of them ever fall through? No, I, I was solid enough. It didn't go through. God, because one of those falls through. You're, oh, they're done. You're done. Yeah. Nobody's getting that out. Nope. Fish the body out of it <laughs> when it starts floating. That's frozen meat for next year. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well preserved. Oh, God. So did you grow up, um, uh, you had some property. Did Were motorcycles in the scene back then or not? Or were you, were you, were you fairly like, middle class or like like me just straight up poor po i mean we ate PO. But oh yeah we grew our own food and had our own beef so exactly yeah. we we didn't go hungry no but we just there was nothing right. extra you didn't get fancy things no yeah you, you played with what you had yep you made things but i guess well when we first got we got a cushman scooter when i was 12 years old my dad snagged it from somewhere and is the cushman scooter the three-wheel thing no two-wheel they had three-wheel trucksters okay Okay. But this was uh, I, Let me look this up. I, I, I think it. ours was a 47 or 48 Turtleback. Cushman scooter? Yeah. Let me know if you see it up on the screen here. Uh, Let me go to images. I got to look this shit up because you see anything close? Yeah, yeah, that one right there. Right here? Yeah, it looked just like that. Really? Yeah. I got to pull it up. This is like a red. Yeah, it looks like me right there. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So it like had a motor in the yeah. back? It, where the louvers are, it, right under the seat. Okay. And the gas tank was there. And This was, is so cool because I've never seen uh, one of these in real life. But it had a four horsepower, single cylinder, husky engine. It was 250 cc, okay. four stroke. Yeah. And uh, had a two and a half gallon gas tank. Well, we took that shell off of there and it built a little seat in the back. That's where my brother sat all the time. And then I'd sit on that white seat. So you put a you put a two up seat in the back. Yeah, we nice. went everywhere, all over the world with that thing. That is hilarious! Yeah. Wow, a little four horse, huh? Yeah. How'd you start it? It the had pull a start kick starter in front, like the the old washing machines had to. If you can look right there at the very front of the shell on yep. the floorboard, right? Yeah, oh, right yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the pedal you start it with. Just really? Push down. It just ratchets up and kick down. Wow. Yeah. Centrifugal clutch, two-speed transmission. Okay. Wow. You guys got to look this up. Look up Cushman scooter pictures. And it's this little red fire engine red. It's got little bars, like beach bars. They're all, they're like beach bars and a little headlight. And you don't put your feet on the side. You literally put them in the middle. So it's like a 
right? It's just one big pan mm-hmm. floorboard. Yeah. That's a cool looking little thing. Now we had, um, I didn't have any of that, but some of my friends had like, I don't even remember what kind they were, but they were like little scooters. And I know what you mean. When you get a little freedom of something with a motor, mm-hmm. that's, <laughs> yeah, we <the> rode <laughs> all over the orchards and yeah. dirt roads and places we shouldn't have been. And um, back then you just rode them on the roads. Mm-hmm. It was country, you know, I mean, we all drove around. Ours were know. gravel roads and logging roads. Okay. And there was a lot of steep stuff up where we lived. And uh, with the two-speed transmission, you take off and you go and, you know, gets going too slow, you had to shift to low. Then when that got too slow, my brother jumps off. Oh, I good. keep going until it goes too slow. And then I jump off and help it up the hill. It'd go up by itself, but not with two or one on it sometimes. Yeah, that was funny. Oh, my God. (laughs) But you were in a hog heaven. Oh, yeah. I know. That's us. You know, you just had something. Um, We ranged like 20 miles or so from home on that thing during the summer, just running all over. Yep. My mom just said, be careful. Yeah. That's it. (laughs) I'm sure you had all your proper safety gear and helmets like me. What? (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that funny? No glasses either. No. No. Didn't even know what a helmet was. Nope. We never, there, the helmets on bicycles weren't even around. Like you didn't see anybody wearing, uh, uh, you know, like the styrofoam helmets you can go down to Walmart now and get like that stuff. You couldn't even find that stuff. And there was no internet to, so it was non-existent. (laughs) Yeah. We rode four wheelers, no helmet. I'm again, this is what I'm saying. I'm lucky to be alive (laughs) um, and not paralyzed because I had some pretty good, uh, I broke two bones crashing without helmets on mm. not my dirt bikes but friends dirt bikes and uh luckily never smuck my head because mm. you know just and we didn't think anything about it nope. that was just normal no no protective gear no gloves no helmet no eye protection but it was all uh, extra stuff you didn't need anyway exactly yeah just extra weight <laughs> then you'd have been really weighted down yep, on that yep. mother <laughs> oh god so um so that was kind of your first introduction to something on two wheels basically yep, yep. yeah you probably wanted a full out dirt bike like every boy. Oh right? yeah. Everybody wants that. Yeah. I dreamed about that. Never. <laughs> number one, my uh, parents were not big fans of motorcycles. Um, uh, number two, we couldn't afford it. So, but I did get to ride the neighbors now and then. Yeah. And that was always a special <laughs> treat, you know, cause they had like real dirt bikes, right. you know? Oh, interesting. So where'd you go? Where, where are we moving on motorcycles from here? Do you, uh, uh, at some point get, uh, bona fide dirt bike or no you just or did this thing die or what well my dad jumped it after a period of time my brother once i'd left i went to military and uh my brother wound up with a harley 80 flathead to go to school on mm. and then about that time my dad figured the cushman wasn't worth anything so he took it to the dump believe it or not oh along with a 45 two-wheeler oh he junked it too because we didn't need it i guess where did that come from? You never got to... Well, there was a, a flood on the Applegate River in 1964, and this went through the flood up what we call the gorge. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom happened to know the, the lady that lived there, and this is all covered up in sand. It was a three-wheeler. Okay. And uh, Good old three-wheeler. Yep. Yeah, she wanted to get rid of it, so they got it and found a two-wheel frame, uh, you know, just a rigid frame, and put it all in there. It never run worth beans because it had sand in it one time. <laughs> <laughs> but they tried. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And me and my brother worked on it, just trying to make it run. And I'm not sure what was wrong with it. It was shot. Yeah, sand. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's a tough recovery yeah. right there. It's like honing the cylinders extra. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Okay. So, but, um, so you, that's kind of your experience growing up, of course, wanting to get into motorcycles. Now, um, you say you're uh, military, yeah. went in the service. Yeah. Navy. When was this? You want me to date myself, right? I do. Okay. I want to give the audience an idea of who I'm talking to 1964, here. 1964, I yep. went in the Navy. Very cool. It's cool because oh. uh, to to know a little bit about the dates because to me, um, and I've told you this, it's amazing, um, you know, the biker community and the patron community and, you know, what's been built here that us being very far apart in age doesn't matter. No, and we don't. can hook up and we've talked a ton um, chatting when I was down there and chatting here and chatting when you're up here, you know, and that's just a really cool thing. Right. Um, that we don't have to be close to age to connect, you know? Right. So 64. 
Yep. yep. <laughs> Navy. Navy. Yep. We talked about my dad was in the Navy. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, you uh, uh, spent how how many years, and then where kind of where were your uh, travels? Well, total is six. Okay. But, uh, Thank you for serving. By the way, we heavily you. support our vets here. You, you know that. Well, go to airplane school. Memphis, Tennessee is where Navy had the airplane school. Did that to be an aircraft mechanic, which it's what my dad did. Oh, <laughs> that's it. This was so interesting. Yeah, very cool. But that's kind of how it went. And Corpus Christi, I've been to uh, Atsugi, Japan, to uh, Seoul, uh, as far as Vietnam, uh, Philippines. Wow. Just a lot of places, different places. It was on USS Lexington, and it was a training ship for, okay. for uh, pilots certifying for carrier landings. That's what it was used for. Okay. So, and it's a museum now. Where at? In Corpus Christi. In, okay. Yeah. So you can go through it. Yep. Not all of it, but part of it you can go through. Have you done that since you? No, uh-uh, I haven't. Really? No. Do you have any I, desire I to? to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Oh, man, we got to get you yeah. down there. Yeah. <laughs> that would be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. They have the ship in San Diego, too. There. Yeah, I forget the name of the one there. But. It was the one my dad was on, and I'm going to blank on the name right now. Really? I'm so stupid because I'm blanking the name, but I got to tour it. Is it still there now? Uh, yeah, well, as of, we went three years ago. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, I'm almost positive. Let's look it up. That's why we got the interwebs. So because it's decommissioned, obviously. Mm-hmm. Right. USSA Midway, Midway. Okay. yep. Yep. So, USSA Midway Museum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Curious thing. Were you familiar that. with that one? No, I just knew of you it. You just knew yeah. of it. That's the one. So, that was really neat for me. Like, because my dad died um, six years ago mm-hmm. of cancer. And, uh, you know, I talked to him about his service and and that kind of stuff. And it's very interesting that I meet you and you both did the same thing. Um, but it was really uh, just because he died and stuff and to be able to go years, it was only a couple of years ago to visit the actual mm-hmm. ship that he was on, you know, um, during Vietnam um, was really inner. It was weird, yeah. kind of weird to know that he was, yeah. you know, going through all the galleys and all that. It's just really, it's cool. If you guys get to do that, I will tell you. You know, on uh, the Lexington, it was in World War II. And my dad was stationed on that ship. He was a plank member out of Hawaii when it was commissioned. And uh, to make it go full circle, I got on that boat too. And then my brother, when they, they were doing a, a U.S. tour and everything, and I told him, if you're going through Texas, stop in Corpus Christi and check out the Lexington. So all three of us have been on the boat. <laughs> wow <laughs> kind of weird yeah it yeah. is yeah hmm so working on aircraft do you work on generally the aircraft or the engines my dad the was engine. more specific to the engines en- engine propellers yes yep engine propellers okay so i did i was in a propeller shop for a while and what they call de-sludge in the dome because it gets uh the oil circulates up through the propeller and because of centrifugal force it takes all the impurities and stuff out of the oil and slings them out like a centrifuge type of thing hmm. and it gets all caked up in there like uh clay you got to clean those out because they don't operate that way so you take them apart clean them out sometimes you pull off the uh de-icing boots off the propeller blade and put on new ones and put hmm. them back and then we had a flow bench. You just run it through all its cycle and everything, make sure it's okay and it's good to go. That's what you do when you're a kid, you know? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. 19 years old doing that stuff. It's weird. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Just like today. Right. There's kids on a boat. Yeah, totally. They are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Interesting. Um, so you didn't take any, my dad didn't either, um, you know, because he had some skills. Obviously, you got gained some skills. But you had no inkling that you should come out into the civilian world and work on aircraft since you already had. I, did. I always asked my dad, did you? Okay, my dad was just like, no, I never did. I'm like, interesting. No, I did, and I went to airplane school and got an AMP license. Okay. You know, hardly ever turned a wrench. 
Got into sheet metal instead. <laughs> you got into what? Sheet metal instead. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, the money wasn't there for the mechanic stuff. And the liability there, it didn't weigh the wages. The wages had been three times higher. Oh. So they didn't have to pay a lot. General aviation is not high end. If you go to work for Boeing, somebody like that. That's yeah. what I wondered. Yeah. Never thought no, about doing that? No, I was always thinking private. Okay. But uh, that didn't happen. Yeah. So here I am. <laughs> yeah. Do you have fairly fond memories of your time in the service? I'd do it again. Yeah? Yeah. That atta, was a lot of fun. Atta boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. I could pick your brain all day about your service time, but well, uh, I got to, yeah, m move. But there's okay. a dark side to that, well, too. You sure. Know? <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, having lots of friends and yeah. lots of stories. <laughs> but, you know, the, yeah, you, you, you know, they're, that's just a, something that uh, you, you can't get an experience like that anywhere else. And I think it makes you grow up fairly right. uh, quick. Yep. you know, too, and, yep. and, uh, makes you realize you're in the real world and, and, uh, yeah, it's good. Cause you get your feet on the ground and you're getting some skills and, and serving our country, which is amazing, yep. you know, um, to be able to say you've done that. So yeah. Big culture shock though, coming from the Hills, going to boot camp, and Oh God, everybody from every nationality is in that one room with you. And it's like, and you're all a piece of shit. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. You're there. There ain't no, yeah, nobody yeah, hierarchy special. there. Nope, <laughs> you. I don't care where you came from yep. or how rich you were. Yep, right here, you're getting treated the same. It didn't matter. Yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, so, so you, I guess you must have got, you got out. You did some of the aviation stuff, right? And then at some point, let's before we get into sheet metal, let's talk about motorcycles. So, it, was it in the military that you were going to get motorcycles well, or? I did. I had a, okay. a Honda 125 Bentley for a while. Mm. That's the old, they, I don't think they were ever imported. But the Bentley engine was a 180 or a, how do I want to say it? It's like the Triumph BSA, both pistons move up and down at the same time versus the Hondas where they're 180 and they alternate this way. And they just, the other ones are two, Pistons go up and down at the same time. No shit. Yeah. Okay. That's why BSA and Triumph. Okay, think, right. Yeah, I forget that. Yeah, they did yeah. that. Anyway, it had a little different sound to it, but it had up sweet pipes to it and solo seat and all that kind of stuff. And You seeing it up here at all on the screen? I did Honda 125 Bentley. Anything close? Oh. We're looking. I kind of want to see what it looks like. Man. Why am I getting these models? I don't know. That's that's too new. Okay, okay. <laughs> if you went back to like maybe 1962, maybe. Well, let's let's uh, narrow it down for the old Google bot here. All right. 1962 Honda 125 it, Bentley. It looked more like that one right there. This I, one? No, this other one, the blue one right there. Right here? It's, okay. Uh, one down. Right, that one. This one? Mm-hmm. Okay. About same color, too. Really? Yeah, but it had a single seat with upsweep pipes. Okay. That's cool. That's cool if you guys get a chance to look at this bad boy. All right, anyways, you, you got this thing when? When I was in Japan. In Japan. Yeah. We weren't allowed to have anything bigger than 125. That was the rules of the base, except for one guy that worked at the White House, which is where the captain, admiral, everybody was. He had a Harley. <laughs> mm. uh, that must be nice. Peons didn't. <laughs> right, right. He's, he knew the right people, yep. apparently, yep. and the right crowd. Okay. So you rode this on base then? No, I rode it off base. You rode it off yeah. base. Okay. It's kind of scary, wrong side of the road and everything, but yeah. you know, it's different. Definitely different. Yeah. No helmet. Yeah, we had to wear a helmet. Oh, you that did? That was back? required by the, the Navy. Gotcha. Yep. That was their thing. Yep. Yeah. Had to have it. They couldn't have you getting hurt. They needed you. No. Nope. Work on those airplanes. <laughs> so wear our flight helmet and it looked good. <laughs> <laughs> you wore your flight helmet? Yeah, you can do that. Oh, no shit? Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, as long as you had a helmet on, huh? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Doesn't matter. All right. So you rode this thing around um, just Where, chilling? Wherever, yeah. Wherever. Yeah, just to get off and, and go. Did a little bar hopping with it too, which wasn't really bright, but you know. That's what sailors do. I was a kid. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. 
Did, did, did the other guys have bikes? Did you ride with other Some guys? Some of them did, yeah. We, yeah. Did, we did that, not very often, but depending on your shift and all that. But. Yeah. Be the Honda Bentley Posse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tearing, tearing up the roads. That's it. So what happens when you have to leave? You leave the bike? or you I sold it. To another guy in the military? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So then where do we move from bikes from there? Tell me your... When well, you just really start getting into... Let's see. What did I do? Do you have any more bikes in the military? No, that was the only one. That was the only yeah. one. Okay. Oh, I went from that to... When I got out, I went to airplane school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bought a... Where at? Uh, I, it was in Los Angeles. Oh, LA. Okay. Yeah. How'd you like LA? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> I already knew probably your answer. Never been back. <laughs> you did not. I think oh. that's... Uh, it sucks. I don't know how anybody, God bless you, because I know we have members from down in that area. God bless you. <laughs> I'll never, ever live there. Yeah. Just flying in there into the airport's bad enough. Yeah, yeah. So, so you went down there to flight school, yep. or, right? Is that what you call it? Well, or mechanic not flight school. school. So mechanic school, yeah. sorry, sorry, yeah. And during the time I was there, I bought a uh, 500 Daytona Triumph, run that around for a while, and then some dude stole it. He got caught. Oh. He broke a leg. I went to court and all that stuff. And uh, they sent him off for whatever reason. The, the bike wasn't, you know, it got wrecked. Okay, yeah. So he got a broken leg out of it. In court, he was just laughing. And, and his buddies were in the in the courtroom. And they was high-fiving back and forth, kind of looking that way. But he thought it was cool. Did you go into court? Yeah. Just to be there? I Well, they asked me some questions. You were the victim. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're their victim witness. Yeah. Right. So that passed and I thought, you know what? I think I'll buy a Honda. So I bought a 450 Honda brand new. Mm. So I, oh man, this is pretty neat and all this and that. And my brother, I'd been talking with him, of course, on the phone and he had a 650 BSA and we was talking back and forth and he's mentioning how wimpy Hondas were. <laughs> oh, what did he have? Uh, 650 BSA Lightning. Okay. Wow. It's a These bikes. Yeah. 64, 65, right in there. It, it was a unit construction, so probably 64. Okay. And, and you had a four fifth Honda 450? 450. Street, yeah. right? Yeah. And I thought it went really good, you know? I was like, dang, I, I kind of got intimidated by what my brother was saying and everything. So uh, I got rid of it. I went down to another place then, and I got a uh, 1970 Triumph Bonneville. Oh, so <laughs> that's where I. What went. year was it? It's seventy. Nineteen seventy. Bonneville. Sure. Yep, I know that one, but I still. They're wanna, a good bike. I like. I still want to look at it again because they're cool. Yeah. Yeah, mine was. I think that one right there in the middle. Right here. That color. Yep. Yeah. How cool. Yeah. Nice, how cool. Nice motorcycle. Buy it used. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Would have been. Um, it's like. Eleven hundred dollars or something. Wow! Or, or, well, they sold for fourteen something new. Yeah. So. Yeah. Nice bike. I had it for several years. Yeah. I wound up making a chopper out of it. Like I was telling you earlier, me and my brother doing the BSA yeah, Triumph yeah. rigid frame, sculptured uh, gas tank, and on this uh, bad boy. Yeah. Would you? Okay, tell me what you did this thing to. Well, we went, so you sculptured, you did the fuel tank, you stripped it down. Yeah, and we kind of started all over, made different gas tank. Uh, what influenced you to do that? Well, partly uh, at that time, Arlen Ness was pretty popular with his Bay Area low riders or what they call them, the sportsers and stuff like that. So we thought, well, we can do that. So we okay. did it. See, you were influenced by something yeah. that made you want to try that because most people aren't like, I'm going to make yeah. a chopper out of this. You, and then you we, got a vision. Yeah, then. Uh, we did some, what I call sculpturing. It had some 20 gauge coal roll and hammer and move and stuff and made sculptured around the, uh, where the seat area is going into the hardtail part and just to make it look, you know, Batman style stuff. But yeah, you know, did you do bars on it? Uh, remember? I don't remember. So you tricked this thing out pretty good, huh? Yeah. You did all this out of your garage? Yeah. Everything. Yeah. I built everything, the sissy bar and the oil tank and gas tank and uh, parts of the fender and different things, whatever I felt like doing. That's cool. But uh, it was a lot of fun. So you're mechanically inclined? Yeah, I would think you know? so. And you yeah. did the airplane stuff. And so, yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah, because some guys are, you know, some guys right. could never do that. They'd just be like, uh, you know, some of our guys, you know, and the, they're inspired because they're changed. We show them how to change our oil mm -hmm. for the first time. So, yeah, you had some. 
Oh, I should have backed up from there. Yeah, please do. Uh, when I got out of the military, I went back home, and my brother still had the Harley 80 flathead. And flathead, I run, huh? I, yeah, it was neat. Oh, God. <laughs> Tank shift, suicide clutch. <laughs> Dude, I wish we had that. So that was uh, a dirt bike. That was, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. a dirt bike. Anyway, I found a Sportster. The dirt bike. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, sorry. A, a 57 Sportster, which is first year of the Sportster. And uh, it was a 900 Sportster at the time. I paid 350 bucks for it, drove the crap out of it. <laughs> yeah? In the hills, up road, logging roads, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Just wherever you could oh, take yeah, it, huh? yeah, it was fun. So, um, where, How long did you have that, Sportster? A couple of years, okay. I think, something like that. So you rode it dirt roads, mm -hmm. paved roads, yep. wherever you could ride it. Is this around Jacksonville? Yeah, yep. Yep. same area. Same area. Yep. Look at that. They're just kind of nostalgic anymore. There wasn't a lot to them. Had brakes and an engine, you know. Right, exactly. It, so. Probably road rough, especially on but dirt yeah. roads. Yeah. Yeah, just <laughs> jar in your back. You can do that when you're a young man. Oh, yeah, it's easy. No big deal. <laughs> That's why backs are bad yeah. now, right? Uh, then I go forward from there. I went through the Honda and back to the Triumph. That's when I went to school. This was prior to that. Okay, what did you, so you chopped this one up too, the Sportster. No, I left it alone. You did? Yeah, I did. Mm, went through a phase there. I did. I, I, you know, I don't know what was going on. Just rode the shit out of it. Yep. Huh? Ever have ma big breakdowns with it, or just it rode pretty good? I mean, you didn't go well, cross country or multi state. You're just riding local. The Kickstarter gear kind of goes out on sportsers. The earlier ones. Yeah. And I, my knee went backwards a few times when I kick it. <laughs> that oh, hurts. God, yes. Yeah. But it, you know, it smoked. It, it burned oil and stuff. But I wasn't really too much into anything. I just riding it. Yeah. You know, so. Was it hard to get started? No. Okay. Reasonably easy. Reasonably easy, yeah. 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 Except when your knee goes backwards. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've had that happen. You push it downhill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So at some point you you got rid of that and you're and you're moving on to what yeah, now? Yeah, then, then the, the aircraft school and then okay. back through the Honda and the, the Triumph. Okay. Then when I got out of school, I went back to Oregon and I got a piece of property, put a mobile home and all this kind of stuff and- Dinked around with that, and then uh, it was about time, I guess, at that time. It, the Triumph went through a couple of different phases. Yeah. Then I sold it, and that's when I bought the Harley Super Glide, brand new. Mmm, so, brand new Harley Super Glide. Wow, you remember what year? AMF years. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> It's 76. 76. Yeah. Wow. $3,400. What drew you to that bike? Besides, it's a Harley. I mean, the Super no, Glide. Just the Harley. I didn't want a bagger. No, okay. Baggers were for old guys. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at us now. Yeah. yeah. Really. But oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah. We talked about that. Um, so yeah, you want a young guy looking for a cool ride, wanted a Harley, right? Yep. What? How long did you, when was that it that one. you got interested in Harley or was it just because you couldn't afford them before? Well, was, I mean, you had the Sportster, I get right. it, but yeah. I wanted to get a Sportster when I bought that Triumph, but I couldn't afford it. Yep. Okay. So, because yep. they were eighteen hundred dollars new at the time. Yeah, God, I didn't have that much money. <laughs> yeah, okay, but yeah, we got into the Super Glide and did a lot of changes to that. I made a fat bob out of it, put a wide glide on the front of it. Really, and five gallon tanks and all that. So and, you straight up chopped the frame. Not no, I used the same frame. The same frame. Okay, so use the same frame just to switch around. the front end. Right. Okay. Yeah, that in the gas tank I put on running boards and stuff like that. But uh, we also did the uh, SNS ninety eight inch sidewinder kit. Really? That was available. And they say, and that's like they right. one hundred and twenty five horsepower. Uh huh. But I don't know of that for sure because I never had on a dyno. We did a bunch of work to them, and they run really well. But uh, that, I went through that. I had thing, that thing, I think, for 22 years when I had that one. Really? Yeah. Then I got off of it and went to snowmobiles, and then I got back to Harleys again. So, hmm. <laughs> Did you do that Sidewinder kit yourself? Yeah. Really? We just bought the parts and did the whole, all the work ourselves. Did you have manuals and stuff? Because there was no YouTube back then or... Premium, premium lab videos to do I've that. I've got a friend named Manuel, but that's about it. Yeah, right. No, we winged it. <laughs> no shit. Yeah. And it ran. Oh, yeah. No, I was fine. <laughs> that's just one. funny because that's how we used to do it. You know, think about this. Yeah. I mean, 
you either knew somebody that could do it or you winged it or there was sometimes manuals that would help you through it. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking back to when I was a kid working on cars, growing up work. I mean, we did all kinds of stuff and I'm just trying to recollect without the interwebs and Mm -hmm. YouTube and all that, how we did it, you know, and well, with the, we were winging it a lot. Yeah. With the, with the sidewinder kit, we had the, the uh, lighter weight wheels, flywheels. Mm -hmm. And so I have a friend that is a Harley mechanic. And after we did the new rods, all this other stuff, we had him, line everything up and true it up so we could put it back together. So I didn't have that. Okay. But beyond that, we did everything. But you knew enough to do that. Oh, yeah. And you could ask a lot. I remember back then, you would ask a lot. You would go down to the, those types of shops and, you know, the guys that you bought the parts from or whatever, and they would mm-hmm. give you hints, right? Right. They'd say, oh, you need to do this. And I've done that before. It's different to yeah. today. You know, There's you a know. few things we had to ask questions on, but, you know, at that time, it seemed like Harley's a little bit simpler, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. That's true. Carburetor and set of points, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's true. They definitely were simpler. My old Chevy truck, you could sit in the engine compartment while you worked on it. Right. You know what I mean? There wasn't just (laughs) wires and shit everywhere. Yep. You could actually drop the motor. You didn't have to have a wiring engineering degree to, you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, good old days, man. Yep. (laughs) Sit in my Chevy, sit in the engine compartment on my Chevy and work on things. Yeah, crazy times, man. Has changed a lot. So you had that. That bike, did you sell that? Yeah, I you sold, wish you still I, had it. Well, in a way, yeah. It, it's know, always the it, it's always the answer. You know, they vibrated a lot. You know, yeah. there was no rubber engine mounts, nothing like that. But oh yeah, yeah. They were somewhere <clears throat> around the eleven second mark for a quarter mile, eleven three, something like that. So they were relatively fast for a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. Did you do any long? <laughs> On that thing, or was this just for bar, bar for lack of a better term, I'm not saying you bar hopping, yeah. but just for bar hopping and lunch and mostly local is what we did. You know, your brother, yeah, with we, you. What yeah. was he rolling on then? The same thing. Okay, so we did them both the same time. I'm tracking. Maybe I missed that. Okay, yeah. Right. Well, I didn't say that, but oh, okay, yeah, I may have missed it too. But, but yeah, the way right. we way we played with the cams and the carburetors, where we would do one bike compare it to the other. And whatever one was best is the way we went. So we spent a lot of money finding the right cam and the right carburetor, and we wound up with something that was really good. Wow. Very cool. A lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money playing, but definitely getting your wrenching and getting your hands dirty. Oh, yeah. For we sure, you did know. did lots of that, yeah. Yeah. All right. So how long, I didn't ask you this, how long was that aircraft school, mechanic school down in L.A.? Two years. Two years. Yeah. So then you came back. You established yourself back in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. You said you bought a chunk, and that's right. when I'm just doing the timeline. You bought the the Harleys. Mm-hmm. You're running the two Harleys, and and uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> then you get get off of one. Like I said, we went off to snowmobiling for a long time. Spent a lot of money hot rodding that stuff. Yeah, so yeah. you completely got out of bikes. Yeah, for a while we did. Mm. Did you miss it? Yep, that's why I went back. <laughs> yeah, so. Let's, in, in your blood, you know. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, everybody that I've talked to that went for any time I did for a time in midlife. And uh, I remember um, having ridden and just the feeling of riding. And, you know, that was always the shrink. It just does something to me, oh, yeah. like so many people. But for the short time, you know, I didn't have one. I s- seriously remember waking up from dreams or dream in the morning <laughs> and of riding yeah. and the feeling, you know, and it was like, there's something to that. You know, you wake up and uh, when you're dreaming about it, you know, just just riding with the Mm -hmm. wind in your face or whatever, you know, so something to be said about that. So let's talk about snowmobiles a little bit. Okay. I think that's an interesting one because you went hard and heavy. Oh, yeah. We did the the full meal deal on the engines. Lots of places to snowmobile down there in your area. Yeah. Right? Around Crater? Well, up Crater Lake, Diamond Lake area. Diamond Lake. Uh, This is all around the Medford, Oregon area. Area yeah. for our Within worldwide about listeners, seventy miles away okay. for the farthest. We have areas close to home, which is maybe ten to twelve miles up into the hills, and you can unload and go from there. Okay, so it depends on where you want to go. Yeah, right. Where right. the snow's the best. Yep, I'm telling you, I know some guys around here, dude. If you think Harley guys are fanatics, these snowmobile guys. Yep. Holy shit. <laughs> and the sad thing is with the snowmobile, you only get like a few months, at least with 
depending. But it's the amount of adrenaline you get. Yeah, it's from true. It. <laughs> apparently, yeah, apparently, because my God, these sleds these days and the the money oh, yeah. that you guys put into these things. Well, so. new new Polaris right now uh, is fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, the first one I bought brand new was four thousand. <laughs> wow, <laughs> been a while back, but yeah, they're blast. Yeah, so you got into that with your brother. Yep, is your brother down in Jacksonville still? Yeah, he lives in Medford. Oh, he lives in Medford. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Medford. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. You guys still do a lot of stuff together? Or? Not so much anymore. Marriage comes into the mix there, and so I know how that is. Yeah, we still see each other all the time, but we don't do the same things we used to. So. Yeah, that's like it was with my brother too. We were, especially younger, we used to get together every weekend and wakeboard and. I had a boat then, and then we'd in the winter we'd snowboard every weekend together, and it went like that for years. And then marriage comes. Now, even when we we're first married, um, we still we we would wakeboard, every, and our wives were go with us and stuff. It's really when kids come is yeah. when <laughs> things get fucked up a yeah. little bit um, in a good way, right? Yeah, right. Um, that's just life changing. But man, and uh, my brother, I mean, we still are close, but we don't. Um, we just fell out of doing that. Right. He's got different age kids than me. And it's, it just, yeah, yep. it sucks. Well, I remember the good old days. That's what happened. Yeah. We just went and did what we want. And then you have kids and you got to yep. get responsible real quick. That made me responsible. <laughs> as responsible as all ever. Did I'll you just be, say, yeah, right. <laughs> right. So how many years did you uh, go hot and heavy at snowmobile in there? Pretty close to 30. Wow. Total. We weren't, well. I, you were out of a motorcycle for no, 30? <sighs> I shouldn't say that because I still had the motorcycle. Okay. I was probably 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Okay. And you guys were, just to put it in perspective for me, you guys are building these snowmobiles out. You're souping them up. You guys are out just- Breaking parts. Yep. Get Breaking parts because <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to tune them, right? Yep. The more you- it's kind of like uh, we've said before, like a Hardy, the more you start effing with them, like when you get up to stage four kits and stuff, mm -hmm. you're, it's cool, but now they're just, the reliability has gone. Yep. That's right? exactly what happened. One year we went through 17 pistons between the two Jesus. of us. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, we were tuning them, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Just running them to the max. You hit 1400 and that piston melts. No shit. Sticks, yeah. And we're just trying to do the fine tuning and just play the game and spend the money. Wow. But so you were doing the work. Right. Yes. Yeah, we did everything. Yeah. Because yeah. you had, I mean, obviously you yeah. could work on bikes, you yeah, could work I, on snowmobiles. Yeah. I couldn't afford the shop rates. I mean, we could do everything, so it's not a problem. Is that part of the experience? Like like motorcycles is being able so. to work on them a little bit yeah, yourself? I'd say so. Yeah. Because we built, take a sled, did one particular point in time, we took a sled, took it all apart, changed it the way we wanted to do it, lengthened the track before people... Before mm. the factories came out with it, people were doing that, and I was doing that. Okay. Changing the, the chain case. You have to lengthen the chain case. Drop and roll is what they call it. Mm -hmm. Cut that all up. Do all that stuff. Lengthen the chain because they didn't sell them the right size. And, yeah, we did a lot of stuff. Very cool. It worked. <laughs> yeah. You get some looks up on the oh, yeah. hill, there was, huh? There like was people are like, what is that? Yeah, there were times like that because we were kind of on the front edge of that in our area. Because okay. these guys, the people that I rode with, they weren't, you know, real mechanical. They could do it if you paid somebody to do it, they'd have it. But right. we'd just show up with something different every week. <laughs> Anybody hire you to start doing that on the side? I Like, I want mine like that. I've done that. Have you? Yeah, like the chain cases and different things like that. But uh, I was selling snowmobile parts, too, some that I made. I think I told you about that before. Yes. Like the, the running boards and the... The uh, cargo rack, toolbox, mm. drop drop roll kits for the a rear suspension on the rear end of the sleds. You know, people thought if they jacked that tunnel up, they'd get more go up the hill farther because they could dig a deeper trench uh, and get stuck worse. So, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, get stuck worse, yeah. harder to get out. Yeah, yeah. I do want to capitalize on that a little bit as we're going to get into a sheet. I want to get dive in a little bit more. Um, to sheet metal and then kind of pick it up uh, where we left off here. Okay. How does that sound? You bet. Thanks guys. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. This is part one of part two. 
of this biker top biker talk episode here with Terry McDonough. Um, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I love these conversations and just the nostalgic bikes that he's talked about and wrenching on bikes and everybody's got their background in bikes and different experience. And I think we can all appreciate Terry's background and uh, relate to a lot of things and we can all learn something from each other. So stay tuned for episode two. We're going to dive in uh, to Terry's background a bit more as far as um, how he really uh, got into law abiding biker media and patron and the metal sheet metal working, how he got into that, where he's at with that and making my workbenches. And if you're interested in workbenches, metal top, this will definitely, if you've ever thought about it, this uh, we're going to break it down and tell you what you need to know, the do's, don'ts, the costs associated with it, um, if they're the right thing for you. So stay tuned for episode two, guys. Two of two. And don't forget, guys, you can't support us financially through the store or patron or donations. We do understand, but you can support us for free by heading over to uh, wherever you listen to our podcast at, any podcast platform, iTunes especially, guys, Stitcher Radio. We're also over on Spotify. We're everywhere. Wherever you're listening, take the time. only takes a second. Leave us a 10-star review. Probably can only leave a 5, but if you can leave a 10, leave a 10. But uh, we appreciate it by leaving us a good review, uh, uh, shooting us a comment. Those help bump us up in the rankings so more bikers around the world can find us and join this thing we call the Biker Revolution. Revolution.